Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're obsessed with movies, whether on the big screen or binging on your favorite Netflix or Amazon series, and you want to learn more about what it's like to produce and direct those films and shows for premium cable television or network TV, then this is the episode for you, my friends, because my next guest is a director who has worked in all of those mediums with countless critically acclaimed pilots and episodes to her name. Let me throw some out there for you. Homeland, The Newsroom, The Walking Dead, Justified, Ray Donovan, to name just a handful. But before I introduce you to Leslie Linka Glatter, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive window into the episodes and the professions we're going to be featuring that week. And it is super easy to do. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee, and that's all smushed together, dot org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is award-winning director, Leslie Linka Glatter. Leslie's TV work includes Homeland, The Newsroom, The Walking Dead, Justified, Ray Donovan, and we're going to include the whole list in show notes so you can see. She's also directed numerous pilots, including Gilmore Girls, Pretty Little Liars, and Six. Her films include Now and Then, The Proposition, and State of Emergency for HBO. Leslie was the executive producer and the producing director on Homeland, which she joined full-time in its second season and continued all the way through its eighth and final season, which aired recently on Showtime. Make sure to watch it. It's another amazing season. Currently, she is in pre-production on her next show, The Banker's Wife, which is an eight-part miniseries for Amazon based on the best-selling novel. Leslie is serving as executive producer and is also going to direct all of the episodes. She began her directing career through the American Film Institute's Directing Workshop for Women. And this is going to be really important. We're going to dig into that because Leslie didn't study any of this in school and actually started off her career in a very different direction. Her short film that came out of the workshop, Tales of Meeting and Parting, was nominated for an Oscar. She's received seven Emmy nominations, seven Directors Guild Award nominations, and she won twice for Mad Men and Homeland, as well as a Humanitas Award nomination for HBO's State of Emergency. Leslie is also serving as the first vice president of the Directors Guild of America and is an advisor at the Sundance Institute's Directors Lab. Leslie, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you still caffeinated on your cappuccino and ready to go? Hi, Andrea. Yes, I am very ready to go and very caffeinated and thrilled to be here. Oh, well, I am just thrilled to have this opportunity. And I want to let our listeners know we are here doing this interview in the second week of June 2020. And instead of being off in Budapest on location, shooting your new miniseries, The Banker's Wife, because of the coronavirus, you are where? I am in my house in Los Angeles, and I have spent more time in my house during this quarantine time probably than I ever have. Oh my gosh. And so do you have any sense when you're going to be able to start shooting and when you do what that will look like? Are you having to adapt the script at all? Oh, these are great questions. I was packed and ready to go to Budapest to begin prep 
when we were all quarantined. So I had my four suitcases and three boxes packed and ready in the middle of the room. And we got the call from Amazon that we needed to stand down. So I'm grateful I didn't get on the plane and fly to Budapest to have to try to get back to America. And, you know, the shock of stopping and realizing the time we are in historically. And of course, it's hard not to acknowledge what's happening now with the murder of George Floyd and what's happening in our country as a result of it. But yes, everything will change as a result of this. Will people still want and need to tell stories? Absolutely, maybe even more so. But how we do it is definitely going to change because a film set, there are so many people working in close contact with one another. It's like a Petri dish. And yes, I'm on a task force for the Directors Guild being chaired by Steven Soderbergh, the amazing director, about how we can return to filming safely. And is there any sense, Leslie, and I recognize We don't have a crystal ball, but is there any sense as to how much longer it'll be before you're able to get out into the field? Well, everyone wants to go back as soon as possible, but it has to be done safely. So I don't know if I can answer that right now. Okay, fair enough. I know our young listeners would love to learn more about your creative an organizational process, Leslie, in preparing to shoot a series like The Banker's Wife, for example. What are all the moving pieces that you're juggling? Yes, there are a lot of moving pieces. And in many ways, it never stops. So let's say we are just beginning the prep process for The Banker's Wife. So What we have done so far, Meredith Steam, the wonderful writer who is writing all eight episodes, she and I took a research trip to D.C. to, oh, I should go back for one beat. The banker's wife deals with the banks that do business with dictators, money launderers, drug runners, the wealthy and entitled. That's the world we are functioning in. And every project that I take on as a director that deals with real world events, you have to do a lot of research. You have to try to get inside of the world to be able to tell the story well. So the first thing we did was we both went together to D.C. and we met with people from the Justice Department and Treasury. And we have a character who's an investigative journalist and we met with investigative journalists. So as much information as we can gather goes into the first step. And again, this is based on a novel. So there is a pre-existing story that we wanted to add more depth to. And then Meredith goes and starts writing. And in the meantime, I have to begin starting with how are we going to physicalize everything she writes? How is it going to become a story? And uh, first of all, you have to have some scripts before you can do that. And in this case, since I'm directing all eight, we need all the scripts to actually begin shooting. But I can start searching for locations where we're going to be based. I can start putting my main team together in terms of who I'm collaborating with. And that entails, let's say, the first people you bring on board are your producer, and that is Karen Richards and Sunday Stevens, two amazing women. Sunday is also my first assistant director, and she is brilliant. She's been with me all on Homeland and on the series True Blood. Our director of photography, John Conroy, our production designer, Jerry Fleming, and locations. And first, we had to figure out where are we going to shoot this project. And because it's an international political thriller that really moves in many different countries, we had to find a main base. And we ended up scouting Dublin, Paris, and Budapest and realized that Budapest would be the best place to base. It has a wonderful crew base with a lot of stage space, and that we would go to other countries from our base in Budapest, meaning we will still shoot in Paris, we will still shoot in Dublin, and then we have to move the production overseas to America, and we would be probably based out of New York and shooting New York and around the area and D.C., 
So it's a big production with a lot of moving pieces. Oh my God. If you're not an organized person or someone who is able to think in a linear manner, would you say forget about it? Forget about directing? Well, if you don't have that skill, you need to have someone around you who is great at it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. You can always hack your way to getting it done. I don't think you can actually, you know, but if you are a great storyteller and you really understand story, that is the critical thing. And we as directors have to know what the directing, the filmmaking process is so we can do our jobs and utilize all the talented people around us. But there are some people who are more organized than others because everyone's process is different. That's what's so amazing about being a director. There's not one path of getting to being director and every individual director's process, though some are similar, are also going to have their unique quality. Oh, that is really cool. Since you haven't started filming yet for The Banker's Wife, I thought maybe we could talk about the series that you did just wrap up filming on Showtime, the hugely successful Homeland. And actually, the final episode just aired a couple of months, actually not even two months ago, was at the end of April 2020. So congratulations. I'm sure that feels like a big weight is off your shoulders. Yes, yes. It's been an amazing process. I think you only get a few of these in a career where you get an incredible group of people, a constantly changing, powerful story, and the environment where it wasn't about being the smartest person in the room, but about being in the room with the smartest people where the best idea would win. And the fact that we reinvented the show every season. And part of that was that we would start our process every year, myself and the writers, the creators of the show are Alex Ganza and Howard Gordon, who are brilliant. I would go with the writers and our lead actors, Claire Danes and Mandy Patinkin, and we would spend a week in D.C. meeting with the intelligence community and basically asking the question, what keeps you up at night? What are your deepest fears? And that's where the new season of Homeland would come from. Mm. So you really were trying to keep it cutting edge and totally relevant with the news cycle. Yes. And again, you can't, it is a narrative story. It's not a documentary. You can't try to outguess the news, but you can tell a compelling story of characters. And I think one of the things I loved about the two main characters, Carrie Matheson and Saul Berenson, is how complicated and layered that both of them were. And certainly having a female lead that is as layered as any man and doesn't always do the right thing, but is always compelling was 10 years ago when this started, it rather unique. I read an interview that you gave, Leslie, in which you explained that Homeland is a show that was primarily on the road and that the longest amount of time you had to shoot an episode in season eight was just 11 days. And nine of those days were on location and often included several moves in a day. And two of those days were on stage. What would a typical day have looked like during season eight when you were filming? Oh, my goodness. Well, again, in this crazy business of film, every day is different. But We were based this year. So I should also add every year we move to a new place. So oftentimes when you're in the eighth season of a series, people feel like they've got it dialed in. You're going back to the same sets. You're on a stage. Everything is kind of a known quantity. But because Homeland changed every season and would go to a different country, we were always starting over. So that kept it fresh and exciting, but it never got easier. So this final season, we were based in Casablanca, Morocco. I was there for nine months. It was very challenging, also very exciting. And so a typical day would be 
maybe you are out in the streets, you're shooting a street scene with 200 background, then you move to a maybe ministry building because there's a scene that's based there, and then you do exteriors of that building. Again, there's a lot of movement, a lot of moving pieces all the time. You just taught a master class on Sundance Collaborative for aspiring directors about how to bring a scene from script to screen. And we'll make sure to include a link in show notes as long as it's still up there because it's still possible to watch that three hour masterclass for free. And Leslie's shot list from season five of Homeland, episode two is there, as well as another episode, I believe it's episode six of season three of Mad Men are there that you can take a look at. And when I downloaded them, Leslie, I was struck by a number of things. And the first was that you didn't type out your shot list. Oh, okay. So just so you know, I was able to find with that particular scene, which is a big action scene, I was able to find the script the shot list and the storyboards for my prep. So I do the shot list for my own personal prep. So the storyboards, everyone had a copy of that. And those are the shots. They were put up on boards. Everyone, we were shooting in Berlin, Germany. So everyone could stop and look at exactly what we're doing. The shots are my personal notes. So that was not given for anyone necessarily to use. I okay. just showed that. They're so, like the companion to the storyboards. Yes. You. When there was, I'm sure there was a typed up version of that for the people that needed it. But what everyone was referring to in that moment were the storyboards. Okay. Is there anything that you think would be valuable for our listeners to know about how you think about a shot list? Maybe something that they wouldn't get out of a a book about directing? Well, it all goes back to story. Story is everything. What story are you telling? What are the arcs of each individual character within that story? What do the characters want and need? What is the theme? What is the text? What is the subtext? It's a deep dive into story. So that's what you have to understand first. You don't start with a shot list, with a plan. You start with your characters and your story. And the shot list comes out of that, comes out of telling the story. Okay, very good. Can you tell when you're watching an episode of Doesn't Matter What or a movie that it was the director who dropped the ball, that something isn't clicking, something isn't making sense, and it isn't because of the screenplay, it isn't because of the cinematography, that it really was that it landed on or the responsibility should land on the director's desk? You know, that is really impossible to know because one is working with a huge group of people. And ultimately, the buck stops. I don't even know if I can say the buck stops with the director. If the material isn't working well, if the script has not developed as far as it should go, if the director didn't understand well or was able to manifest the storytelling, if the cast, you know, casting is so important. If somehow the wrong decisions were made in casting, I mean, there are so many things that have to not work for something to not work. It's not just one thing. It's not as simple as, oh, the director dropped the ball. It might be that. But there are many things involved. Certainly, if I look at my own work and if something didn't work, I will take a huge amount of responsibility for that because I'm just that person. But again, it's a big moving machine. You might have a producer who has final cut and the director doesn't have final cut. There are not that many final cut directors. So maybe the director and the writer, the script was wonderful. The director did a great job and 
the producer who ultimately had final cut or the studio said, no, 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 we don't like this. We want to cut it this way. Well, then it would be, you know, the studio who made that choice. There's okay. no way to know what actually happened. Okay. I had no idea. So I thought I would ask. I'm not sure how many listeners know, Leslie, that you actually didn't take on the role of producing director, and we should also define that, until season two. And you guest directed an episode of Homeland in season one. No, that's not actually correct. It isn't. Okay. So I have been a producing director and executive producer on numerous shows. With Homeland specifically, I had been on another series when they asked me to come in and direct in the first season. I was unavailable. But when the season came out, I fell in love with the show. I thought it was one of the more interesting thing I had seen in years, not just because of such compelling characters, but because I never knew from one moment to the next if Brody was a traitor or a hero. And it was so complicated and compelling. And one of the things I love about Homeland is scenes where you have two characters with two opposing points of view, and they're both right. So it was so interesting to me. So I got asked to come on to direct an episode. So one hour of this 12 hour novel, and I had an amazing time directing. And it was uh, an episode called Q&A and a very challenging episode, beautifully written by the late, great Henry Bromel, that was 40 pages in one room which is very challenging for a director. But of course, I was in that room with the amazing Claire Danes and Damian Lewis. And they asked me to join the show full time season three. Okay, gotcha. Are those guest directing opportunities kind of like an audition for directors? And why is there a need for guest directors and a producing director. Okay. So maybe the term guest director gets confusing because when you go in to direct an hour of any series, you are the director. There's no other director. There's only one director to an hour of storytelling or a two hour movie. They're not multiple directors. So As a director coming in who's not on staff full time, you want to tell the best possible story in the best possible way and understand everything about that bigger picture, what the arc of the whole season is, but also that one hour of story. The difference between an executive producer, producing director, is I am on the series full time. So I am there to be sure that The director of the episode coming in has everything they need to tell the best possible story. If it's information about the crew or about the cast or things they need to know and to be there as they're prepping the series, that they have everything they need. Once they go on the set to be directing, they are the director of the episode. So I am there as an overseeing position. And probably like the connective tissue between every director who comes in. Yes, but I am not I am not directing when another director is directed. Got it. I direct four of the twelve episodes every season. Again, we have a show that goes on location. So the writer's room is in Los Angeles and the production is wherever we are. So one year we were in South Africa and another year we were in Berlin and So I am the person on the ground where the buck stops. And I am always working in collaboration with the writers in Los Angeles. Before I ask about the impact of the streaming services on the industry, I thought it would be a good time for you to do a little ground truthing for our listeners about what it's like to work in the directing side of this business. And as you were saying during our Espresso Shots episode, it is anything but glamorous. Right. (laughs) Yes. I think that's probably the biggest surprise when people come to visit a set 
is that it is a lot of long hours. It is, I mean, again, I want to start off with, I love my job. I love being a storyteller. And even on the most difficult days when everything is going wrong and you have to be out in the cold or the wet or the burning desert, I still love being a storyteller. You get to tell a story with amazing It's a team sport. So putting together the best possible team of artists to help you tell that story and having everyone on the same page, it's a wonderful thing. But again, a normal day is a 13 hour day, meaning 12 work hours and one hour for lunch. That doesn't include the time getting to set, having to wrap up all your instruments if you're on the crew and then going home. So what's a normal day? 15 hours? You know, I as a director, even though I prepared everything during the prep period, I still have to review it. When I get home, I have to read the scenes, prepare myself for the next day, go through all of my notes. So it is not for the faint of heart in that way. It takes a lot of stamina and you have to work really well with others to direct everyone toward the same goal. I have no doubt As you know, Leslie, the mission of Time for Coffee is to help college students and young professionals to turn their degrees into careers they will love. For those young listeners who want to do what you are doing now, who want to direct and get into making films or series or whatever the case may be, what impact have streaming services had on the industry, specifically in terms of the number of opportunities that may be available now? Well, there are many more opportunities because there are many more shows. So I think the world has changed drastically in terms of the outlets from, let's say, when I started directing. When I started directing in terms of television, there were the big major networks, NBC, ABC, CBS. That was it. And all the different studios in terms of film. So the business never stays the same. It's constantly changing. That's the one thing you can bet on. So with the streaming services, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and the whole range of them, I think it has created certainly more opportunity, which I think is great. There are many more outlets, many more ways to see things, to see content. But also I think what it's done is make it a bit harder to find things because there is so much. I still feel like the best will rise to the surface. And I think it's a great time to be a storyteller in that way because there are so many ways to have your story seen. You know, it used to be that film and TV were very separate. And now I feel like some of the best stories are being told on television. You can tell a six hour story if that's what your story needs to be or a two hour or an ongoing series. And uh, we are definitely in a golden age of television because some of the best writing, directing, performance is on television. And I think that opens up the world in a positive way for filmmakers. I would be remiss if I did not ask you, Leslie, what you would recommend our listeners watch that may otherwise be overlooked or what you've been binging on during the coronavirus? Any new discoveries, shows you would recommend? Absolutely. I have a whole list. There are so many things to watch right now that are amazing. So I would say just first off, I just finished watching a Swedish series called The Restaurant that's on the Sundance channel that is amazing. My Brilliant Friend, based on the Elena Ferranti novels on HBO, is fantastic. I think The Plot Against America on HBO, also given the time we're living in, completely fascinating. Fauda, which is on Netflix, is very powerful, unorthodox, Mrs. America. I have a whole list. Oh my gosh. A lot of things to be watching now. Have you seen The Bureau? I love The Bureau. I watched it. I started watching it several years ago. Okay. Yeah, we just discovered it recently, but can second the notion on Fauda. Amazing. Leslie, 
One of the things that you've certainly benefited from was the fact that you were mentored by two of the greats in the filmmaking industry, by Steven Spielberg and David Lynch. Just very briefly, how did you get those opportunities? So my first short film called Tales of Meeting and Parting, I made through the Directing Workshop for Women at the American Film Institute. I applied to that program. And I have to tell you, I was completely unqualified. It was set up. It's a program set up for women in the film business who hadn't directed. I was not in the film business. I was a modern dancer and a choreographer, but I had been told a series of stories when I was living in Tokyo, Japan, that were my mentor stories. And I felt like I had to pass them on. And I knew it wasn't dance. It needed to be the actual narrative story. So a friend of mine, when I finally moved back to America, having been living overseas for 10 years, told me about this program at the American Film Institute. I had just moved to LA because I was married to someone at the time that I'm now divorced from. And he was moving. He had a job in LA. So we were coming here. I was on my way to New York and ended up applying to the program. I miraculously got in. I should also add, I was told not to make the film I wanted to make if I ever wanted a job in Hollywood. Really? Uh, Who told you that? I'm not going to say who it was, but it was done out of compassion, not out of something negative, which is even stranger, but it's it my story was three quarters in Japanese, so it needed subtitles. It had narration. It was a period piece set in World War II, and it only had one Caucasian character in it. So all of those things would have been seen at the time as a recipe for disaster. It was completely non-commercial, but I didn't care. Those were the stories I wanted to tell. And that's what I did. So, you know, I came from a different field. I didn't have a filmmaking background. So I ended up working on 10 of the other women's films in the program. So I would learn the process of filmmaking. One of the great things about coming from dance is you can't cheat. If your leg goes up in the air and and I can't hold my balance, you're going to know immediately. There's no way to fake it. So I believe in filmmaking. There's no way to fake it. You have to really learn what you need to know. And it's a lot of different areas. So that's what I did. I worked on all these different films before I made my first film. And I made this film, Tales of Meeting and Parting. And, you know, when you're asking everyone on your crew, on your team to work for free, all you can do is try to get as many people to see it as possible. And I sent out this film for every film festival and award possibility. So it would be a way to help pay back the crew who had been so wonderful. And miraculously, it was nominated for an Academy Award for short feature which is an incredible thing. On incredible. A I was stunned and thrilled, of course. And as a result of that, Steven Spielberg saw the film, and I thought this was so exotic, on a plane, and he called me up. I should also add, when he called me up, I thought it was a friend making a prank call. So I <laughs> But and, and that's where I did my first job with was through the amazing Steven Spielberg. I directed three episodes of an anthology series that he was producing at the time called Amazing Stories. And he asked all of his amazing director friends to come on board and direct. And then he gave opportunities to three new directors. And I was one of them. And that really was my film school. Oh, my gosh. And there's a wonderful story about you watching David Lynch work and learning about how to stay open to the moose head. Oh, yes. Well, so I directed three amazing stories. That was, again, my first professional job. And because I came out of dance and did not go to film school. The directing workshop for women was a a grant program where you were given a small amount of money. In my case, I think it was $1,500 to make a short film. So you were only there for three days and then you were on your own basically making your short. So I felt at that point that 
you know, I did not go to film school. I did not have that opportunity. So when Stephen hired me on Amazing Stories, I asked if I could shadow him and learn from him. And I was able to shadow another director on Amazing Stories. And I, because I wanted to learn, I wanted to be sure I really understood the process before I was again out on my own directing again. That was so formative in my process. So after Amazing Stories, I took my first job in series television, and that series was Twin Peaks. So I should also add that these two series were very director influenced. So I never looked at TV is a lesser medium than film. You have to tell a great visual story. So for me, learning from both Spielberg, who taught me to stay connected to my instincts no matter what, and then going to David Lynch, a brilliant director, couldn't be more different than Stephen, but with their own brilliant process. So what did I, what do you learn from that? You have to find your own process. So I'm a big planner coming out of modern dance. I like to have thought everything through. And that allows me, that kind of preparation allows me to be in the moment and open to everything happening. So with David, my big learning moment with him is I fell in love with Twin Peaks. From the moment I saw his brilliant pilot, I was like, oh my God, if I could ever be on that show, it would be amazing. So luckily he actually called me and As I was getting to know him, there was a specific scene, not in the pilot, but I think in his first episode where Michael Onkeen and Kyle McLaughlin are in a bank vault and they are opening a safety deposit box and on the table is a moose head. And no one ever really refers to the moose head that sits there the whole time, but it's there and it's brilliant. So when I got to know David, I asked him where he got the idea to put the moose head on the table. And he looked at me like, what do you mean? And I said, well, where did it come from? And he said he walked into the room and the set decorator was going to hang the moose head on the wall. And David saw it, it lying there on the table and said, leave the moose head. And something opened up for me in that moment where you have to come in with your plan. You have to know what you want, but you always want to be open to the moose head on the table. You always want to be open to the opportunity that presents itself that you could have never imagined alone making your plan. Be open to life as it's there. See that as a gift and utilize that in your storytelling. You have obviously taken advantage of every opportunity or many opportunities that have come your way. And you've also been very vocal and proactive in your efforts to bring more women into filmmaking, specifically into directing. How do you think the state of the industry is right now for women directors? Great question. So when I started directing, there were very few women directors. And for me, coming out of modern dance, which is very female, it just never occurred to me that a woman couldn't do this job. I had never thought that way. And when I looked around and saw how few women there were, I felt like once I got to a time where I was really working all the time, you really need to grab the hand of the next generation and open the door. And that was not how things worked back then, but I felt it was important. And I can say it has been joyful seeing so many of the women I mentored out there in the world directing with huge careers. And I do think the world has changed. I think things like Time's Up, the focus on the lack of women directors has made a big impact. The fact that it became part of the public zeitgeist, has really moved the needle. For many years, it didn't move. It was about 14% of all the TV that was directed was directed by women. That's very low. And I can't tell you how many times I had someone say to me, we hired a woman and it didn't work. And we're not going to hire another woman. I mean, what a crazy statement that would be. You would never say we hired a white guy once and we're not going to hire any more white men. That's crazy. Everyone is individual. And I think 
thank goodness that has really changed. So in the statistics, the DGA statistics from last year, it was actually 50-50 in television between male and female directors. I think there's still work to do on diverse directors in TV, absolutely diverse women directors. And there's a lot of work still to be done in feature film where the statistics are not great. How is the quarantine and COVID going to impact that? Hopefully we will not slide back. Hopefully we are we will be in a new normal. But again, hard to know from where we all sit right now inside our inside our houses. But I think the world has changed in a positive way, but we always have to be diligent. Absolutely. And I'm going to include a link to the American Film Institute's directing workshop for women, which you attended. It started in 1974. It has over 300 alumni and they accept eight new participants, which isn't a lot. But hey, you know, if you want to get into the industry, what an amazing way to try to get your foot in the door for sure. But there are many programs. Directing Workshop for Women is fantastic, but the Sundance Directors Lab, the Screenwriting Lab, there are many, many programs. There's not just one anymore. Back when I started, there was one. There are many programs in terms of television as well. So again, not that there's not much more work to be done. There is. But I think on the positive side, because I think it's always important to remember the positive, there has been a shift. Remember, we're in a time now where people can make a movie on a cell phone. So, you know, I encourage especially younger directors to tell their story, have a story you're compelled to tell, pick up a camera, make your film, do whatever you can to continue being a storyteller. Don't wait for someone to give you permission. Give yourself permission to tell your story. You need to be proactive all the time. As you mentioned now on several occasions during this interview and during the Espresso Shots interview, you started out as a modern dancer and a choreographer. And it was based on this chance meeting that you had with a Japanese man while you were living in Tokyo that inspired you to pursue filmmaking. But when you were in school, Leslie... As you and I discussed, you started out at Washington University in St. Louis as a pre-med student and then transferred to Southern Methodist University and graduated with a degree in comparative arts. Did you have any idea what you were going to do with that degree when you graduated? No. Well, again... There are many, many paths to directing. That's what's so tricky about it. There's not one correct path. I wish you could say, oh, if you did X, Y, and Z, this will happen. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Everyone you talk to who is in film has a different story as to how they got to doing what they do. When I went to university, I was dancing. I was already a dancer. And at the time I applied to Washington University in St. Louis, I actually thought that I was going to be a dancing neurosurgeon. I know that sounds insane. I thought I would operate on brains by day and do concert modern dance at night. After a year of pre-med, I realized that was not going to happen. And also as a dancer, you're an athlete and I needed to be out there dancing. But for whatever reasons coming from my family, I felt like I needed a degree. So I was able to transfer to Southern Methodist University. I was in the dance school. I was taking a lot of art classes. So I placed out of a year from taking advanced placement tests. So I was able to graduate in I think it was two and a half years, maybe almost three years. So I graduated when I was 19 and a half because I was ready to be out in the world dancing. But for whatever reasons, I wanted a degree. You don't need a degree to be a modern dancer, quite honestly. But that was my process. So I moved to New York after that and then ultimately moved to London, England, and then Paris, France, and then Tokyo, Japan on different grants where I was teaching, choreographing, and performing. And how has your choreography training and your dance experience 
influenced your directing? Oh, hugely. With filmmaking, you are constantly learning. You never stop learning. There is always something new. So when I came in to filmmaking from a dance background, for me, blocking scenes felt very natural because dance is moving people from one place to another. So doing an action sequence also feels very natural for me. But there were so many things I didn't know. So if you have a paint box of colors, you are constantly acquiring new colors. I needed to learn about lenses and how they make you feel emotionally. I went to an acting class to learn how to best talk to actors. You are constantly trying to acquire more skills. So you see the big picture of filmmaking because you are working with so many different artists in different areas to create the story. You're constantly learning. But yes, I think dance was actually kind of an unusual background to come from, but a very useful one. Also, as I mentioned, you can't cheat at dance. So you know how to learn. You know you have to go from point A to point B. And if you skip a point, you're going to have to go back and get that information. And that's a great training to come from. Absolutely. I think there's so many lessons that come out of that, not the least of which is you can find your way to where you want to go if you're determined enough. And it's going to take a lot of being proactive to fill in the yeah. gaps. Absolutely. Just two final questions, Leslie. Sure. I try to ask all of my guests if they could share a time in their professional life when they struggled. Maybe you even failed at something. And personally, I see failure not as a scarlet letter that we should wear, but rather a badge of honor. And the most important thing here is how you persevered through that challenge mm. and a lesson that you may have learned in the process. That's a great question. So I look back to a time where I was doing a pilot for a network and they insisted on hiring an actor that I thought was wrong for the project. But they basically said, unless you hire this actor, we won't make the project. So of course I did. I was scared. I hadn't been directing all that long and I felt like I had no choice. So I directed the pilot and it did not come out well. And I was blackballed from that network and had a really hard time getting hired again. Because even though it was a request that the network itself made, I was the one who was blamed for it not working because they have to put the blame somewhere. I felt terrible. I thought, oh my God, is this the end for me? Am I never going to work again? And it was very scary and depressing. But I realized I could not let that get me down. I had to start over again. You know, even though I had probably been directing for maybe six or seven years by that point. And I went out and did all the meetings again. I remet everyone. I had to climb back on the bicycle and start again and be tenacious and not, you know, it only takes one person to say yes in a sea of no's. And it took a while, but I was able to get another job and to kind of, you know, uh, rebuild myself again as a director. But it was, it was hard. And I definitely had that feeling of like, oh my God, am I going to be able to do this? Or is this over for me? So I have to say that kind of tenacity is really essential. And also to remember that nothing ever stays the same. Everything changes all the time. So if you are at the top and everyone thinks you're fantastic, well, that's going to change. And if you are at the bottom, and things look totally dismal and dim, you know that's going to change. It's not going to stay in that place forever. So we have to be able to deal with that constant flow and not give up. But in that need for tenacity, I think it's really important to remember the joy and remember the joy of what you love about being a storyteller because you don't want to get so... I don't know, depressed and sad that you can't, when you are given the opportunity again, you can't embrace all that is positive. It's a, it's a tricky balance. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Leslie. 
Absolutely. Final question. If you could go back to college, go back to Southern Methodist and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I think I was so anxious and ready to be out of school, to be in the real world working, that I would tell myself to take advantage more of the moment that I was in for learning, to study things that just were areas of curiosity for me, whether it's philosophy or archaeology. Everything you study becomes part and parcel of who you are as a person and makes you have more things to tell stories about or make dances about, that it's not just being out in the world. So I wish I had taken more advantage of that time just as a learner because I was so anxious to get out in the real world. So yeah, I would love to go back and study all the things that I'm fascinated by to read. I love literature. I'm constantly reading. How amazing to go back and do that. But again, I think you can only do what you do in the moment you are in. And learning is a lifelong pursuit. So I would totally encourage that and that everything becomes part of that paint box so that you can tell stories. Well, all I can say, Leslie, is that neurosurgery's loss is (laughs) all of our gain. And we are just so fortunate that you decided to follow your interests follow your love of dance, which led you to Japan, which led you to the coffee shop, which led you to meet one of your mentors, and then brought you into the world of directing and storytelling. I want to thank you so much. This has been so incredible. Thank you for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. You are really a remarkable person and so generous with your time and your wisdom. Well, thank you so much. It's been a a joy talking with you, Andrea. And just I encourage all of you to follow your dream. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee. 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.